Welcome to another discussion of this week's article on uh, heathenhasanear.com. Uh, this week's article is beginning a new series called What Trinity? And the title of this article is The Godhead. And we're referring, our, our scripture reference is out of Colossians 2.9, which says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, when I began to research this word, Godhead, I discovered that it only appears three times in Scripture. And in each time, it uses a different Greek word that's translated into this English Godhead. And each time, those different Greek words mean different things. Um, so that's going to be the, the, the premise of this discussion is to kind of dig in and, and find out why this principle that has so uh, undergirded the Christian philosophy if it's so important, why don't we hear more, more about it in the scriptures themselves? And, and in the Tanakh, or the what's been renamed as the Old Testament, it's not even found. So what, what, what's going on here? And... My friend Jim is with me today to help us kind of sort this out. Say hello, Jim. Thank you, Harold. And welcome to those who are maybe here for the first time. To you in particular, I don't think you'd be here unless you were looking for something. Well, I hope what you're looking for you will find. Uh, this is normally a very dry subject to Godhead, but Harold, I'm trusting that you'll do a thorough job with it. <laughs> well, I'll do my best. I'll give you that. <laughs> um, the, what I discovered in, in the Tanakh there is, the reason that the Godhead doesn't appear is because uh, the original words of Scripture uh, proclaim that there is only one Yahweh, one God. In, in Hebrew, the concept is known as the Shema, which says there is but one spirit, and his name is one. Yeshua said in John 4, 24, that Yahweh is spirit. So every time the word God is read in scripture, we, we should be thinking spirit. To know the source of life, who is uh, an eternal spirit, and the Messiah the one whom he sent as the image of that spirit manifested among us, which is eternal life. The English word translated as Godhead only appears, like I said, three times in scripture. Uh, <clears throat> and the three different Greek words that are used um, the first verse is, comes from uh, Colossians, which we, we read already, is um, theotis, which is derived from theos, whose meaning is deity. The other two Greek derivatives 
from Theos, translated Godhead, or Theios, a gen general adjective used by the Greeks for divinities, found in Acts 17, 29, that is also attributed to uh, priests, singers, rulers, prophets, as well as to Yahweh. And Theotis, which is only found in Romans 120, meaning divine nature, but is also applied to royal majesty. Now, words mean things. So how do the translators arrive at Godhead from these definitions unless they are interpreting the word through a theological lens, not linguistically? There is no justification for translating this word as a noun about the Trinity and even capitalizing the word in translation I mean, it's hardly justified without some theological bias. Um, the Roman Catholic doctrine of the Trinity is non-existent in Scripture. The word itself cannot be found in the original Scriptures or any of the translations. The doctrine of Trinity was manufactured by men in the centuries after the resurrection to promote a Greek ideology uh, elevating Jesus as a God equal to that or even above Yahweh, and thus provide support <laughs> for replacement theology, a political agenda of, of men deliberately designed to separate G Gentiles from the Hebrew roots of faith you know, I can't think of anything that could come up with more of a stumbling block to a Hebrew that introduced the idea of multiple gods, since the very core of Hebrew worship is God is one. But the Greeks had many gods. And so that's where I think this jumble comes in. They, they're just not used to the idea of one god. Well, in fact, when I was in Israel, when somebody would, would ask me about the, the Messiah, Yeshua, and I would begin to explain it, the first thing they would ask me back then was, do I believe that the Messiah, the Son, Yeshua, Jesus, whatever you want to call him, is God. And it, of course, at the time, I believed that. And so I'd say yes. And in every case, they would bring up the first commandment of the 10 words. You shall have no other God before you except me. And I had no answer to that. So I started getting into scripture to find out, you know, to find an answer. To, to, to get around it or above it, you know, go over it, around it, or under it, anything. Just, you know, something to knock that thing loose and couldn't find anything. And the more I looked, the more I saw this divide between the Tanakh and the Messianic writings. That it's only until the messianic writings that were introduced to this idea of a triune godhead christianity was formalized in 325 ce and they were a those guys that they convened at that council to established Christianity, they did a couple of things. They were enamored with Greek philosophy. And the Greeks believed in many gods. And so they, when they were 
you know, writing the foundational tenets of that religion, that that philosophy influenced them into into putting a lot of things in place. Um, and the second thing was, is that they wanted deliberately to set a divide between anything Hebraic in this new Roman religion. It was the religion of Rome. That's why they call it the Roman Catholic Church even today. And <clears throat> so when you when you see those those two um, uh, markers in place, you begin to see that we're what we're talking about is a new religion that in, in Christianity is a new religion that was developed by men and had nothing to do with the original um, Hebraic idea of there being one spirit and his name is one. So over the centuries, that philosophy and that's really all it is because you cannot find again you cannot every other every other premise that that i have come across in scripture i've i've been able to find a a um an explanation from it in the words of scripture now with the Trinity, I, I can see how men have cobbled together different scriptures to uh, arrive at a conclusion. And it's very well put together. I mean, I'm not denying that. The problem is that I, is that I cannot find that doctrine in scripture, even in the Messianic writings. It's I'm glad you can't find it. Let me just bring in an idea. My whole time in many of the Christian churches, uh, you know, father and son is something I can understand and get a hold of. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the third person, I don't know anything about it. And anything I read in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, they, it's talking about the Spirit of God. I understand that. But then when people tried to explain to me this trinity, I, I, you know, I sit there with my mouth on, what are you talking about? You know, they're bending over backwards trying to explain something that's incomprehensible and a fabrication of man. So insulting to our Hebrew family that we have been grafted into. When I got that implication, it really took off. Now... One of the other things that I discovered is that if we're to be intellectually honest with the words of Scripture, it must be understood that everything, this is what I discovered, was that everything Yeshua said can be found in the Tanakh, the original words, the original books containing the words of the Father. Uh, Yeshua agreed with those words. He didn't, he didn't bring forth a new set of commandments like people say uh, the Beatitudes are, but I researched the, the Beatitudes and I found that every single statement Yeshua made in, in what is considered to be the Beatitudes, can be found somewhere in the Tanakh. Yeshua never said or did anything that did not support and uphold this Hebrew perspective of there being only one God. Not once does Yeshua ever refer to himself as being that one God. He always refers to himself and is referred to as the son, a distinction that carries a preeminence without detracting from the preeminent one. Um, this 
triune theology, the tradition of men that has been handed down to us is the definition from Mark 7, 13 that tells us it's the tradition, Yeshua said it's the tradition of men that nullifies, make void. Word of Yahweh, go ahead. Um, I've tried to figure out why uh, the Christian community wants Jesus to be a God, because it separates them from what he did. Of course he could do that, he was God. So it kind of like gives me a, 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 a pacifier so that, well, I'm not expected to do that. After all, I mean, Jesus was God, you know. Do you, do you see that as a detriment to the path that we're supposed to be on? Well, of course. And, and in John uh, 17, when, the, when Yeshua is praying to the Father, he he specifically said that in praying for the 12, that they become one, or the Hebrew word is ichad, which means one or unity, that they that they become ichad with the Father, just as in like fashion, in similar manner, that he is one with the Father. And then you go down further into verses 20 and 21, and he expands that prayer to include not only the 12, but anybody that believes on the, uh, on the words that they say, that they become ichad with the Father, just as in like manner, in similar fashion, that, that he is one with the Father. So, the words of scripture themselves put aside that that particular idea that you're talking about. So when we approach spirit, we can expect to be treated in the same manner as Yeshua. And we can expect to be received in the same manner as Yeshua. Now there's two caveats to to coming into that into that position. And the first is that you have to keep the 10 words of the Father found in Exodus 21 through 17. And Yeshua reinforced those words several times. And he also said that he didn't say anything unless he first heard the Father speaking. You know, I, I've heard that you say that many times, but I never believed it. I know over the years I thought it's kind of a general remark. It was only when I began searching them out that I said, oh, okay, that's not an exaggeration. It's just, it's not throwing in some words. His level of obedience was shocking that he was able to keep his mouth shut when he was supposed to and open when he was supposed to. That's something that I've had to learn slowly. Yeah, it's, the, none of this just falls on us. It's a, it's a journey. You know, it's a lifelong journey to understand these words of Scripture and, uh, you know, what they, what they really mean. But once you get a, uh, once you begin to get an understanding of them, all of a sudden you see that you can keep these words. You can do what Yeshua did, uh, which was to remain one Echad with the Father. Um, and in doing that, he, he manifested the nature of spirit, which became a light. It's, it's just this brilliant light that... Um, you can't necessarily see, but it affects everybody around you. These, these scriptures are, it, it, it's not a conspiracy. I mean, it, it has developed into one, I guess, but uh, the, the translators, they were, 
I mean, they were just doing the best they, they could. But when you, in, in any, any time you're translating one, one language from another, if you, if you run into a word that, you know, you can, you're not sure about, you can translate this way or that way or this way. The translators, like anybody in anybody else, they're going to, they're going to pick a, a word they're comfortable with that um, aligns with their own theological bent. Um, and then, you know, it, every time those words are translated, you run into somebody different that doing the same thing. And, and, and over the millennia, you know, you, you we wind up with this confusion that uh, the scriptures themselves say do not abide with, with spirit. Can I uh, ask you to address the idea of Hebrew language structure and gender. I'm familiar with German. I'm reasonably fluent with Spanish. But I'm familiar with the idea of the nouns are masculine, feminine, rarely neutral. And how that creates a problem with the scriptures going back even to the beginning. What a lot of Christians like to do is to point to the uh, verse in Genesis 126 that says, let us make man in our image as evidence of the existence of Yeshua from the beginning and thus support the notion of a triune God. I mean, there just had to be more than one uh, being present the time that these words were spoken to be able to to use these words in any manner right well no not exactly um the way the verse is actually written says something more it, it says and yahweh said let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So it, it's important that all of the text be included when, when searching for the truth in the words. Uh, and this is a serious problem we get into when just a portion of scripture is pulled out of context and applied to what we have already made up our minds to about its meaning. Words mean things. You're going to hear me say that a lot. <clears throat> a, a closer look at the meaning of these words will supply us with a solid foundation from which to view the text of the words of Scripture. Um, demute is the Hebrew, Hebrew word translated likeness. And it is a feminine noun. Uh, Teslim, the Hebrew word translated image, is a masculine noun. So a quick look through other uh, places of this usage in the Hebrew text uh, supports the idea that the essence of Yahweh incorporates both masculine image and feminine likeness characteristics. These words are not speaking of two separate entities. They are speaking of one entity, Yahweh, who captures the characteristics of both genders in the same entity. It, you know, I, I wanted to believe you when I first heard it, but, but I had to go back and check it. You know that I've been trying to learn Hebrew for months now. And sure enough, uh, I will testify that what you're saying is true. The, those two words, they are masculine and feminine. So I have no question about that after that. It's only because of the replacement doctrine, the re replacement theology of the Christian religion, 
that a dual Greek God theology is overlaid onto these Hebrew words, uh, thus changing their meaning. The evidence uh, of a single entity is borne out in the subsequent verse 27, which says, so Yahweh created man in his own image, in the image of Yahweh created he him. Male and female created he them. Notice, notice the, the personal pronoun in Genesis 127. His and he are all singular, whereas in Genesis 126, they're all plural, us and our. In Genesis 127, only one individual is actually doing the creating, Yahweh. So to explain the, the, the variant of, of uh, plural pronouns in, in Genesis 126 and the singular pronoun in Genesis 127, um, Trinitarians say, well, in Genesis 127, we only see singular pronouns because the mystery of the triune God is being revealed. Uh, that is, God is telling us, um, know that even though he is three, he is also three and one. <laughs> I mean, it just gets crazy. The, the things that people bring forth because somebody's told them or it's some teaching that they've heard from somebody they respect and all of a sudden logic and reality just flows up the window. The words on the page do not support such an arrival at, at, at such a concept. It, it is only through the, the twisting of the words, the redefining of the words, the expansion of the words to just include whatever we want to throw in there. And it, it winds up just being a big murky mess. Uh, and, and everyone, particularly every teacher that or pastor or, or preacher that I ever confronted with this three in one doctrine, they couldn't explain it. Uh, they would try, you know, until the different questions kept knocking down their explanations. And finally, all they were uh, left with was, well, just believe it. You know, you just got to have faith that this is what it is. And it, I, I, I was flummoxed and which started my journey uh, into really questioning uh, what these words mean. Tell me again, what would be the motivation for creating that untruth? Well, again, we have to go back to the origin of Christianity in the Council of Nicaea, uh, 325 CE. They were under edicts from Constantine, the Roman emperor, who had been looking for a religion to, to be the Roman religion to unify all of these different uh, portions of the, the world that they had conquered and were now under the umbrella of the Roman Empire. But Constantine, the, the, the Roman Empire as a whole, um, hated Jews, hated Hebrews. Uh, and so Constantine put forth some edicts that this council were to include in their, in their foundational um, uh, treaties. And, and it all had to do with there not being any any connection to anything Hebraic. Would you say that Constantine was a very spiritual man, or would you say he was a politician with a problem? 
he was a Roman dictator. Um, his political problems he dispensed with by having them all killed. And in, in similar fashion, that's what he was doing to the uh, anything Hebraic. I read the language from that council that pertained to their feeling about Hebrews. It was shocking. I mean, if I ever had any doubts after having read that despicable, uh, barely human, uh, they really put them down and created that separation between us and our adoptive family. And so then you, you go into what is known as the Dark Ages. And the reason they're called the Dark Ages is because the scriptures were not available to anybody except the Catholic priests. In fact, if anybody was caught with a Bible, uh, it was a capital offense. They'd be, they'd be killed right there on the spot. And, and that went on for centuries. Um, and so when, when we emerged from that dark ages um, and the, the printing press evolved, you know, the, the, the scriptures be, began to be more accessible to the common guy. Uh, but by that time, <laughs> the translations of the scriptures had been so um, eroded. You have to remember, like I said earlier, anytime we translate a language from one to another, there you just lose a lot. You know, and 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 these scriptures have gone through <clears throat> Hebrew to Greek um, to through Latin and three incarnations of English. Uh, so Hebrew is is a language that's it's just not like any other language um, because within within the Hebrew language, there are meanings attached to words. Words often have, have a dual uh, layer of meaning. And when you're translating, you know, letter for letter to get it exact into another language, you lose that dual meaning because there's no way for it to be translated into these languages. And that's why you find when we, when we read the scriptures, we have to remember that every single book in what we call the Bible, regardless of what language it was originally in, they were all Hebrews. And they all had a Hebrew perspective, a Hebrew mindset that was cultivated and influenced by this Hebrew culture um, that gave them this unique Hebrew perspective and the, and particularly in the, in, in the messianic writings, uh, all of these letters, and that's really what they, what they were. They didn't evolve into books until sometime <clears throat> later, but these, these uh, letters uh, were written primarily to a Hebrew audience who understood the nuances of this Hebrew duality of language. And, if we don't try to get into that perspective of that Hebrew culture with these words, we really can't understand what they are trying to convey. It's, it's an impossibility. Um, now, the scriptures in English, uh, as, as, over overwritten with uh, meaning and and uh, transcribing fluctuations that may have occurred. If you're seeking truth with all of your heart, with all of your might, as I was when I first started, all I had was the English translations. I asked the Father to show Himself to me, uh, and He did he began taking me through these scriptures and showing me truth. That's one of the promises that we have from him, both 
in the uh, Tanakh and in the uh, Messianic writings that he will uh, be found of us and he will guide us into all truth. Uh, not just in the scriptures, but into who he is, into his nature. Uh, and, and the more I, I rested and relied in him to fulfill that promise, the more he did. And I began to see him for who he was. And I saw the discrepancy in a lot of these scriptures, and it propelled me to dig deeper, to find out what these original words were, what they meant and how they got translated into something different from what they meant. Um, you know, the Trinitarians uh, talking about this three in one concept often point to the fact that the word for for God in in both of these verses in Genesis 1 26 and 27 is the Hebrew Elohim uh, which is a, a word that is specific to the Hebrew language um, they assert that Elohim is a plural word in the Hebrew indicating more than one person therefore when Elohim says let us make uh, it is the evidence that of uh, the, the three plural persons of the Trinity speaking as one person. Well, while it, it is true Elohim is the plural word in the Hebrew, it is not used to indicate plurality in number when constructed uh, together with singular nouns or pronouns. Elohim is known in Hebrew grammar as a plural of majesty. It's derived from the Hebrew word El, meaning strength, and thus Elohim amplifies the meaning of strength, El. Uh, in Hebrew, the the literal rendering of Elohim uh, would read the strongest strength or even the strongest of the strong. Uh, the word itself is plural. The singular is Eloah. And it is sometimes translated as gods when referring to a plurality of false gods. When it refers to the one true God of Israel, Elohim, plural, is correctly translated as God, singular. But God is, is a word that has been um, interjected into all of the scriptures. Um, if you go back, if you take a, even the Strong's lexicon and you go and you find a place where the word God is used, and you go back and you look at the Hebrew, uh, where the, the, the Hebrew source of that word God, almost always you will find the word Yahweh. <laughs> Why? Uh, and Yahweh appears in Scripture over 6,500 times. But not once does that word appear in our any of our English translations. Now, to me, that's strange. This word God has no meaning. I mean, I listen to people use it. It's obvious they can make it mean whatever they want to. But the word Elohim has a strict application that identifies the supreme deity of a group of people traceable through the scriptures. There's one scripture that I really like, Hebrews 11:6, And without faith, it's impossible to please Yahweh, okay? It has the word God, but I'm reading it the way it should be. Because everyone who comes to him, singular, must believe that he exists, and that he rewards those 
who earnestly or diligently seek him. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that he exists and he is a rewarder of those who seek him. What I've seen clearly demonstrated, it takes two things to get on the path and stay on it. You got to want to be there. You have to be willing to take some changes and uh, you have to be earnest about it. And, and the only way you're going to get a revelation of who he is, is just exactly that revelation. There's a lot of ideas about him, but until you get a revelation, at least for me, that's, it has to be very personal. Would you accept that? I mean, am I sure. ever? No, sure. I mean, it, that's the way it happened with me. When I, when I first met the father, I, I was, I didn't know anything. I was searching, diligently searching for truth. Um, and when, when, in my search, I, I didn't, um, I, I didn't know what truth was. Uh, it wasn't until he appeared to me that I even understood he was a who. I just, uh, I didn't know. But when he did, I mean, every fiber in my being knew this was true. And that's what set me on my journey to follow him. Now, I, I got off in a lot of different <clears throat> places. I spent 30 years in Christianity before I finally got shed of that thing. And then it took me another 10 years <clears throat> to get all of those principles and ideas and thoughts and doctrines that had so interwoven themselves through everything that I had thought about scripture. <clears throat> and when I finally did that, I came to this place where I saw clearly that Christianity wasn't, wasn't who truth was. <clears throat> and they, in order for them to exist to, and to use scripture as the uh, basis for their faith, they have to redefine these words to fit this preconceived theology that they have come up with. And when, when you're, you're taking a figure in, in the messianic, that's, pr that's presented in the messianic writings as the son of Yahweh, the kinsman redeemer, the Messiah who has come to extricate, uh, to, to redeem Israel out of the darkness that she uh, was involved in because of the sins of the first father, Adam, uh, it passed down through all those generations. Um, in, in, to, to make that fit their, their theology, they have to yank this figure out apart from all of that, all of the Hebraic um, uh, tenets or tangles or threads of that, put this guy, Yeshua, I mean, Jesus on a pedestal and call him a God and worship him. <laughs> and nowhere in scripture does it say that he's to be worshiped. <clears throat> You have a religion that is worshiping a God other than the God of Scripture. If you don't call yourself a Christian because you've been through a paradigm shift, what do you call yourself? How do you describe what you do? There are those that just call me a bumbling idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I am a follower of the, I am as the original first century um, followers of the way of the Nazarene. That's just that simple. 
You're not trying to turn people into a he or a Jew, are you? By using all this special language that's familiar to Hebrews and Jews? No, as I stated earlier, I'm not a follower of, of any movement, religion, institution, anything. Um, you sound messianic, right? I hear a lot of things you're saying similar to people on the YouTube who call themselves messianic. Torah followers. I'm, I am not a messianic. Um, the uh, part of the messianic Judaistic movement. That movement is a religion unto itself. What it attempts to do is to take elements of the of Judaism and elements of what they think are true or noble in Christianity and combine those two together to form Messianic Juda Judaism. Um, but most people are not aware of the fact that um, Muhammad, when he was first starting out, he became a baptized Christian. And what he attempted to do was the same thing that the Messianics do, is that he wanted to take elements of Judaism and elements of this new Christianity and, you know, put them together until he had that encounter with whatever spirit that was in that cave and came out with, a, you know, the Quran. Uh, but if you, even if you read in the Quran, you will find... Um, shadows of both Judaism and Christianity, you know, and that's, that's why it's, it's, that was the philosophy that he began with. And the Messianics are just doing the same thing. They have become a religion unto themselves because Christianity by its, by its, its traditional underlying doctrine rejects everything west of the book of Matthew. Uh, in order to become a Christian, you have to do that. They say it, it's no longer applicable, uh, except for maybe inspiration or something, because when, when Jesus died on the cross, all of that was nailed to the cross. Well, we discovered in a previous article that that's not true. <laughs> that's not what the words say. Um, and so here we are faced with this dilemma. Okay, well, what do we call ourselves? Uh, where, how, who, who are we? Well, we're followers of the way of the Nazarene. I'm Derek Nazarene is the way it's, it's said in, in Hebrew. And it, it is, it's, it's not a movement. It, it's an individual revelation. And in that individual revelation, we find that we get to walk a path. Yeshua said, I am the example. Follow me. Take up whatever cross you have to bear on a daily basis and follow me. And when we look at the life of Yeshua, he wasn't going to... Um, praise and worship congregations. <laughs> he walked a very solitary life. Um, he, he had some disciples, um, but for all intents and purposes, you will find in the scripture, he spent more time alone with the Father that he did with the disciples or, or anybody else. And it was because of that that he walked this solitary life. He wasn't lonely because he was in constant communication with the Father. And, you know, prayer, the definition of prayer uh, is simply that. It's a, it's a communication between two people that love each other. Uh, it, it's, it's not it's not this thing that Christianity has made it into, but it's, it's, 
and, and, and for many people, that solitary existence comes as a shock because, you know, they come out of Christianity where there's all this rah-rah, chumba, you know, shouting and thing, people shouting at the ceiling, not realizing that when we receive, Yeshua said in John 14, 23 and 24, he says, if you keep my words, my father will come and abide in you. He will make his residence in you. He will dwell in you. And I will come and abide in you if you keep my words. And the words you hear are not mine, but my father's. He's speaking about the 10 words of Exodus 21 through 17. That's you said on occasion that it doesn't take you very long to listen to a person before you can decide whether they got it or not. So comparing what you're speaking to a messianic follower, I don't, I don't know what to use there, messianic Torah observer. What, what are some of the hallmarks that separate you from those because they got a lot of good stuff uh would you agree to that in the same way the term gentile believer is oxymoronic because a gentile is somebody who comes from another nation who worships other gods than the one true elohim of israel messianic believer messianic um, uh, Judy, um, whatever they call themselves, Messianic Judaism. Messianic Torah observers is kind of like what I've heard. Well, the problem with that is you don't find true Torah observers in 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 Messianic in Messi Messianic uh, movements because they have been indoctrinated by Christianity that they can, they can define the words however they want. And they, they'll keep some of them. Mm. But when you, when you start looking at all of them, there's just, you know, it's what's known as the 613 ordinances that were given to a specific people in a specific place in a specific time for a specific purpose. And since the resurrection of Yeshua, what happened in that, in that transformation, um, particularly on the day of Shavuot, which has been renamed Pentecost, um, when Yahweh's spirit was, was poured out in the fulfillment of this covenant, that there would be a kinsman redeemer to redeem Israel was fulfilled. Um, it was on that day that the temple, you know, Yeshua pointed to the temple and he said, uh, you know, you will, I'm, I will tear it down and rebuild it in three days. Well, he was talking about the translation, the transliteration the transference, the um, transcendence of the physical temple to within, to within those who um, keep Yahweh's words and manifest those words in the example of Yeshua. Uh, and I haven't found any Messianic who, who doesn't understand the 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 um, perspective that we are now that temple that temple the, the scripture says that Yahweh's throne is in heaven so wherever Yahweh's throne is that's where heaven is and on the day of Yom Shavuot Yahweh's throne moved from without 
from the heavenlies to within. And because his, where his throne is is where heaven is, heaven moved with him. And now heaven is within us. Heaven is a state of being. It's not a place. All and, of a sudden, I have an answer to my question. Thanks to, in three days, I will re, rebuild it. I, I see that now much different than before. I also see the shift between what you're saying and the Messianic people. I think their bent is to get that temple rebuilt in Israel and start a lot of that stuff all over again. Uh, that being the case, that is a real divide. Well, there's a lot of things roaming around out there. That's, that's one of them. But the point is, is that this, this place of Echad with the Father is not a physical thing and it's not a religious thing. It is simply us being partakers of the divine nature. And that only happens through individual revelation from who he is. When, when Yeshua and the disciples were, uh, one time Yeshua asked them, who do, who do they say that I am? And there was different answers. And then he said, so who do you say that I am? And Peter spoke up and said, you are a Mashiach, the Messiah, the, uh, the son of the living Yahweh. And Yeshua said to him that flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but only my spirit in heaven, and it's on this rock of revelation that I will rebuild my assembly, my call. And, you know, that is the, that is the only way we come to an appreciation of, of who he is. Now, you, had, you mentioned a while ago that in a few minutes of, of a discussion, with somebody, I can determine pretty much where they're at. Um, and it's because people who are partakers of the divine nature manifest that nature in their every word, in their every thought, in their every action. And within a few minutes, I can, I can tell where pretty much where the person's coming from. Not because I I you have to make allowances for the youthfulness of some or the maturity, the level of maturity, uh, understanding. That is a paradigm shift. Uh, it's so clear to me now. Well, if you remember when you and I started, I never mentioned, uh, you know, the your old age disability. <laughs> uh, it must be good time to wind this up. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I didn't take advantage of that. I just. Uh, I just kind of, you know, put it on the back burner and and off. <laughs> well, it has been a a, a um, profitable time. I think. Wouldn't you agree? I would. And if you would like to, uh, if you're watching this and uh, you have any questions about it. Uh, you can uh, read on my website. There's a on the home page. The articles are listed on are listed on the left hand side, and in the upper right hand corner, there is a search engine that you can put in a keyword and search the the whole website and bring you up different uh, different articles to read. I would encourage you to go there and just begin to be immersed. But if you have questions specifically that, um, that you can't find, uh, please write me, uh, Harold at he that has an ear com, and I'll be happy to uh, entertain your questions. And, and uh, not that I have all the answers, but, but it would be an honor for me to uh, delve into the scriptures with you and learn with you of uh, who this uh, who this person, Yahweh, and his son, Yeshua, are.
I want to remind uh, the folks that are watching this, this is just the first part of five because the topic is so large, it would overwhelm them if you tried to give the whole thing at once. And I also want to remind folks that this discussion is not the article. This is, we're just, we're just bouncing through the article and picking out a couple of things to, to talk on. There's much more uh, in there. And I would uh, encourage you to go and to read the article and uh, see if these things are true or not. So thanks for watching. Shalom.